Thank you. Uh, Bonnie, that's a great intro. I want to thank you for that. Um, you know, I don't know where to start, so maybe uh, I'll start when um, I was a teenager with my marketing. I started with a window washing business. And I used to go to people's houses and knock on the door and say, would you like your windows washed? And they would say, how, how much is it? I'd say, well, it's $100. And I didn't get any jobs. Could you also use that, please? Sure. So, so I thought about it for a while, and I, I decided my approach was wrong. So I started knocking on doors and saying, would you like your windows washed? And people would say, well, how much is it? I would say, well, do you want the inside and the outside? They, they go, yes, and say, would you like us to take down the screens, hose them down, dry them, and put them, put them back in? They go, yeah, we'd like that. Do you want us to wipe down the sills inside? Yeah. And then I'd list it all again. I'd say, okay, to do this and to do this, to do this, that'll be $100. We got almost every job. <laughs> so that was my first uh, marketing lesson. There have been a few uh, since then. Um, these days, uh, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about where we are and then sort of how we got there. Um, we have the nine offices. I don't believe any other estate planning firm in the country has, one has five, a few have three. So how do we have nine? Well, we have sort of a unique approach. They're all main offices. They're all designed to be main offices. Every office fully equipped, fully staffed, because no client wants to walk into a satellite, do they? No, nobody wants to do business with a satellite. So they're all designed to be main offices. And when the clients are there, all the services are available. The offices are designed, well, there's one in Middletown, but they're strategically located where the clients are. Novel idea. But um, so actually, our lawyers move around. The offices are stationary, but the lawyers move around. And we go to places where it's easy for the clients to get to. And you'll see the strategic locations. There's Saratoga. We also like destinations. Uh, Saratoga is a destination town. So for 50 miles around, people like to come to Saratoga. That helps our business. Middletown, a destination town, if I ever saw one. People would come from all around. But it, it's convenient. You know, Middletown is at a crossroads. As you know, we're in the um, you know, Orange County Medical Center. It's a crossroads. Uh, when I look out on, on Route 17, to me, it looks like the New York, New York State Thruway. I mean, the amount of traffic going through there is tremendous. We're in Rhinebeck. We opened that office about a year and a half ago, and it's our third grossing office. Why? Because Rhinebeck, partly because Rhinebeck is a destination town for 50 miles around. People want to go to Rhinebeck. So if we give a seminar in Saugerties, we give a seminar in, in, in Catskill or, or Millbrook, wherever it might be, and, and we mention the office in Rhinebeck, so people think, well, yeah, might as well go for the free consultation, then we'll have lunch, or we'll walk around, we'll do some shopping. You know, strategically located. And also, we like being there, so that makes us feel better and um, results in a better situation with the client. Um, we published a book in the fall. I gave you a copy of it. Um, it's called Elder Law Estate Planning, Ettinger on Elder Law Estate Planning. Now, there is no or there was no, until I wrote that book, there was no subject known as elder law estate planning. There's estate planning and there's elder law. Well, we put it together because the estate planning lawyers are planning for death and they're getting the assets to whom you want, when you want, the way you want, with the least amount of taxes and legal fees possible, and the mortality rate, at least last time I checked, was still 100%. So <laughs> everybody needs an estate plan. But what happens is most of the estate planning lawyers don't practice elder law. So their clients become disabled. They don't know how to protect assets or a nursing home. They don't know the Medicaid rules. And 50% of people today become disabled. And if you have to go into a nursing home these days, you're looking at about a $13,000 a month expense. And you have to pay for five years. You know, people lose, lose their home and life savings. So we also practice elder law because we want to get those 50% of clients when they become disabled. We want their business. We don't want to send them somewhere else or have to tell them we don't do that type of work. And uh, that's something we picked up pretty early 
in, in the practice of estate planning, estate planning lawyers, well, I saw the opportunity. It was right after I started, 91, around 92. 92, I joined the um, National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys and become an elder law attorney so I could service those clients who eventually became disabled. Now, it didn't make a big difference in the beginning, but over 10, 15, 20 years, we've had thousands, unfortunately, thousands of clients become disabled, but we've been able to service them and help them, and the, the fees are, are significant. I have a lot of colleagues all around the country who are quite unhappy that they didn't decide to pick up the elder law specialty 20 years ago, because when you're a 55 or 60 year old lawyer, you really cannot pick up uh, a new practice area. The, the amount of information required and experience and knowledge you simply cannot acquire, except by doing it every day over a period of years and years. What's an elder law attorney? That's the attorney you go to if you have to go into a nursing home to protect assets, knows the Medicaid rules. And those lawyers know how to protect your assets, but they don't do estate planning. They don't, they don't save taxes. They don't know how to keep the assets in the blood. They don't know how to avoid probate. They don't have all the estate planning techniques, so the clients get the nursing home protection. They don't get the right estate plan. So we've been practicing elder law estate planning now for the better part of 20 years. And I took this from my strategic coach, Dan Sullivan. How many of you have heard of the strategic coach? How many of you have a business coach? A good thing to have. I've been um, in the strategic coach program for you know, decades. And um, I think everyone should have a business coach, no matter how good a marketer you are, because I figure if Michael Jordan needs a coach, Michael Ettinger needs a coach, <laughs> right? What does a coach do? What does a business coach do? Do they teach you? Coaches don't teach you. Coaches make you better. They bring out the best in you. They put you through exercises that make you a better you. So take a look at strategiccoach.com. Uh, Dan Sullivan, my strategic coach, has trained over 11,000 entrepreneurs. He's the best in the world. And they have different levels depending on the size of your business. So strategiccoach.com. Just to give an example, I spend $50,000 a year, $50,000 a year on my own coaching. People to coach me. You know, that's a significant sum. But as the coach says, what's a better investment than your investment in you? There isn't any. So I get tremendous value for that, and I recommend it to you. So the strategic coach said, if you name the game, you own the game. If you name the game, you own the game. And that's why we call it elder law estate planning. We named it, we own it. We're the only firm that does it, and, and I think we do it well. Now you have a copy of my book. I brought the book, it's a gift to you. Um, we published it in the fall, but it has to do with a concept we call moving the free line. Moving the free line. What's that about? How much do you give away for free? Do you know the more you give away, the better it is for your business? Creatively thinking, what can I give away for free? Now, you've all heard the concept giving to get, right? You know, I'm going to give something so I can get something. You know, give to get. Well, we're past that. It's not about giving to get, it's about giving to give. Giving to, if you give to give, if you have the other person's concerns complete in your mind, you don't have to worry, you're gonna get. It's not part of the equation. It's, it's, it's almost automated. At Ettinger Law Firm, we give away over a million dollars a year. Well over a million a year. We sponsor over 200 seminars. We invite people to dinner. We take over 10,000 people a year out to dinner. Not only do we take them out to dinner, but we give them a beautiful brochure, all beautifully printed materials. When they come to our office, we give them, well, of course, we give them a seminar that we spent years uh, honing. Then we offer them a free consultation. Come in. 
One of our lawyers, 15, 20 years experience, spend an hour with you, no charge. And just for coming in, we'll give you a free copy of Ettinger on Elder Law Estate Planning. And if you like, you can have a bottle of Ettinger water <laughs> if you're thirsty. And we'll give you an Ettinger pen. And when you do your estate plan with us, you'll qualify for the Ettinger Law Firm tote bag. <laughs> and we like to tell our clients, you know, this bag, you know, this is a $5,000 bag, nicer than a Kate Spade, <laughs> because they just did their estate plan and put it into that bag. But we're always looking, what can we give? What can we give? What can we give away? What more can we give? The more you give away, the better it is for your business. Let's talk a, a little bit about branding. Okay, I'm going to go, you know, in and out here. I'll give you a few stories along the way, but I want to mention branding. How many of you have a logo for your business? Do you have a logo? It's indispensable. You can't have a business without a logo. And you also have a slogan, right? You know, I, I come from a long line of entrepreneurs. My grandfather was a peddler. And he used to push his wagon around and, um, in the old country. And then, you know, came to Canada in, you know, the Russian Revolution, 1917. And um, he sold, uh, bought and sold scrap metal. And his slogan was, don't be a sap, sell us your scrap. <laughs> well, it's a good idea to have a brand and to start to develop it. Now, our logo is Ettinger Law Firm in the form of a shield. Now, it's subliminal. You know, there's a shield there. So without thinking, right away, we're telling people we're going to protect them. That's why we did in the shape of seal. Obviously, there's law, the scales of justice. We uh, have our trustlaw.com website there, which I recommend that you visit. You'll uh, learn a lot, but you'll see a lot how a website is designed because we spend a lot of time on website design. And one of the things you'll see is right away on the first page, well, we have an animation, a cartoon, actually, of, of our process and how it works. But there's Call to action right away, right on the home page. If you don't have a call to action on your home page, you know, you're losing that five seconds that somebody's going to be spending looking at your, your uh, website. So there has to be that call to action, so you'll see that. But our slogan is protecting your future. You know, they say the best slogans, three words or less, you know, just do it, you know, Coke is it. All the big companies, you'll see, three words or less. So try to keep it short and, and to the point. Because it starts to develop. You know, you, your brand starts to develop. Now, if you want to develop your brand, I would recommend you get yourself a copy of Kellogg on branding. Kellogg on branding is a fabulous book. It's written by the faculty of the uh, Kellogg School of Business, the faculty of the marketing department. Kellogg has the best marketing department, the best MBA in marketing in the country. And each of their professors wrote a chapter. And if you want to brand your business, read the book and you will know everything you need to know virtually about, about branding. My view of branding is that it is absolutely everything that you do, okay? The clothes that I'm wearing are my brand. Everything I'm doing is my brand. When somebody walks into our office, we're very conscious, you know, if you ever get a chance, walk into the uh, Ralph Lauren store on Fifth Avenue. Ralph Lauren is one of the greatest branders in the history of marketing. Now, when you walk into his store, one of the things I noticed is, no matter what angle you look at, you know, you can look sideways, upside down, backwards, forwards, you know, from any angle, and, and you know, on the staircase, it looks fabulous. No matter what way you look at it, no matter what you're looking at, no matter what corner, okay, the guy is brilliant. 
That to me is great, great brandy. So everything you do, and this is, in my view, one of the biggest mistakes people make in their business is they don't take a look and say, is this great from the moment the client steps in? Is it a great experience? Does it look great? Does it smell great? Does, are all five senses engaged? You know, is, is, has everything been addressed? Go back after we're done today. Look at your business and look at it, okay? Does it look good from every angle? Organized, clean, you know, inviting, warm, smell good, etc. Let me tell a, a tale. I was at a very fine restaurant uh, by a very famous chef just a few days ago. And he has two restaurants. So he has a number of restaurants, but he has two. They're connected by a hallway. And I just, uh, you know, it was kind of an impromptu. I was in, in that town, so I went into the restaurant, and they have like a cafe part where you don't need a reservation, and then they have the hoity-toity part where, you know, you have to, you know, reserve weeks in advance. So we went to the cafe, you know, had a dinner. It was, um, you know, up to par. Went into the uh, area that's joining the two restaurants. It was the bathroom area. I'll never go back to this place. Okay. There were, you know, it was, the walls were dirty. The bathroom was, you know, lousy, you know. So that made a very bad impression on me, I can tell you. Because I always extrapolate from the seen to the unseen, right? Look, this is out in the open. If I can see this, what's going on in the back that I can't see? I'm not going back to this place. Very famous chef, you know. Maybe he can fool a lot of people, but didn't, didn't fool me. So go back and look at your business uh, for, from that point of view. Now, why am I such a big fan of marketing? Well, when I was a young lawyer, about four or five years out, I was working for uh, big New York City law firms, and I decided that I wasn't going to uh, be a success in that line of work because I had an entrepreneurial mindset. And if you have an entrepreneurial mindset, you're not a very good employee because a good employee is somebody who does what they, they're told. <laughs> right? And I had my own ideas. Sometimes better ideas than my employer. But you know how that goes, you know. And I appreciated that 100%. I knew I had talent and ability, whatnot, but I knew I wasn't the best employee because that just wasn't my calling. So I left the firm, and um, they thought well enough of me to give me a job with one of the clients or to recommend me to one of the clients. And I became a lawyer for Playtex, in-house corporate lawyer. Now, this is a cushy job. I mean, it's 9 to 5, five o'clock, you're out of there, you know. And I took that job because what I really wanted to do was start my own practice. So I had enough time in the evenings to start developing my own, my own law practice while I was working for Playtex. But here's what I learned at Playtex that really impressed me, which you would never know unless you were inside large corporate America. And that's the marketing department at Playtex is bigger than manufacturing and research and development combined. Who would know? And not only is it bigger than research and development manufacturing combined, but all the top salaries are paid to the marketing department. All the best, you know, all the top talents, all the big money. It wasn't in the legal department. <laughs> So that impressed me. And then when I started my practice, I noticed when I was first out you know, in the early 80s, I read that Jacoby and Myers had a marketing budget. They spent $27 million this year, 82, 83, whatever it was. They spent 20 million, $27 million in advertising. That made a tremendous impression on me because does anybody know Mr. Jacoby? No. Does anybody know Mr. Myers? No. All they know is Jacoby and Myers, law firm, 27. So, so it taught me it was all marketing, right? I mean, it's 100% marketing, 0% 
skill, talents, the, the reputation of Jacoby Myers. Never forgot that lesson. So I became a big fan of marketing. So I started my practice uh, in Scarsdale. I was a general practitioner. And then I wanted to uh, get out of Scar you know, I, I was single and it was a lousy place, you know, suburbs of New York City was uh, not a place I wanted to be single. Um, it just, you know, everybody's married there. So I decided I needed a change of scenery. So I decided to move to the Hudson Valley, mid 80s. And I opened an office in New Paltz, but I had a thriving practice in Scarsdale. So how, how was I going to pull that off? Well, what I did was every day I'd go into my office in Scarsdale and I would, you know, pick up the mail and, you know, do a couple of things and I would forward the phone. They had call forwarding in the, those days, you know, thank heavens. I would forward the Scarsdale phone to the New Pulse office, get on the throughway, and all my calls from my Scarsdale practice were coming in, and you pick up the phone, you know, nobody even knew I was, wasn't there. So um, I was able to build up the practice in New Pulse, but the way I did it was I had to start from scratch, and how was I going to get business? So I thought about it, and I came up with an idea. I would develop a lecture and I titled it The Broker's Right to the Real Estate Commission. The Broker's Legal Right to the Real Estate Commission. And then I went and I knew all the brokers met every Wednesday morning. They had their meeting and they did their caravan and they did the, the, the business of the office. So I, so I went to each office manager around the Hudson Valley and I said, you know, I have this lecture uh, on the broker's legal right to the commission. Would you like me to present it? You know, well, I mean, talk about something the broker is interested in, the right to the commission. You know, that was an easy sell. So they all asked me virtually to, to give the talk, and, and uh, it was well received. And then they asked me how much did I charge to do a real estate closing. Well, I knew the going rate was 400 bucks, so I said 350. <laughs> and so I started to get a lot of real estate closings. And the banks got wind of this. You know, this guy's, you know, doing all these closings. So the banks hired me as the closing attorney. Why? Because they thought I would bring more, more of the clients to them to get the loans, which is correct, because I had an awful lot of clients. And so I started to do the closings for the bank, and we were doing, at the height of it, four closings a day. And the bank paid us $400 per closing. And that's taught me a tremendous lesson, which I will never forget, and that is, there's money in volume. There's money in volume. I had never made that kind of money doing anything else. I mean, being a lawyer in practice, trying to get one client at a time, fine, but doing four closings in one day, 1,600 bucks in a day, I mean, it was unbelievable money. We were, you know, we were just beside ourselves because it was a machine. It was, you know, coming in automated. So that impressed me. And, and the other thing about it is, I saw that you have to do a lot of the same thing well, right? It's a matter of doing a lot of the same thing well, focusing your energy, doing the real estate closings, represent the clients, doing the bank, but all in the same area focused and uh, repetitive, and, and it creates quality. Eventually, uh, I formed a, a law firm with a partner, and we moved to Highland at Canino and Ettinger. And serendipity being what it is, um, right after joining up with Canino and forming the partnership, I got a call from a woman in California asking us if he wanted to advertise for personal injury cases in New York. How'd she find me in Highland? Of all the lawyers in New York State, she found me. Well, she found the right person because I say yes to everything, you know. <laughs> My kids will tell you, you know, you know, dad's like a salesman's dream, you know. Yeah, I say yes to everything, you know, fairly quickly. So we, we actually took the whole state, you know, and uh, I, I convinced uh, John Canino to go and borrow $40,000 to pay for the, the program. But we were going all over the state. We were, we were um, getting personal injury cases in Rochester, Buffalo. I would drive there. Okay. It, it also reflects on, on, the, um, on the multiple offices. You know, I just have a tendency, 
instead of thinking about how difficult something is or what a burden it is, I, I just think about is it possible? I don't think about how difficult or, or what sacrifice. I just think, is this possible? Can I do it? Can I do it? And it leads into a, one of my favorite expressions. OK, so I, I, I'll, I'll tell you in a moment. But when I was, uh, I was in Fishkill thinking about, should, should I open an office in, in, in Tarrytown at the time? And you know, I mean, it's not next door. But when I thought about it in terms of possibility, yeah, it, it's possible. We could do it. We could do it. And uh, Bonnie said, I'm driven. But OK, well, I am. But you know, I enjoy it. You know, I'm driving the car. I'm driving. You know, I, I, I like it. So I have this expression I like to use. And, and maybe you might want to take it down. I'll repeat it, but I'll say it first. Tell me what it is that you want that you can't have. And I'll ask you, what is it that you aren't willing to do? Tell me what it is that you want that you can't have. And I'll ask you, what is it that you aren't willing to do? So I'm willing to do it, you know. And you know, other people think it's crazy, and other people are going to think you're crazy either competitors or colleagues or neighbors or relatives. But who cares? You know, you're driving the bus. If you want to do it, good for you. That's what America is all about. I have an identical twin brother. He says I'm driven. <laughs> you know? OK, well, you know, I am. It's just my, it's my character. But I'm very happy with it. And uh, I enjoy the basic, the bottom line is I enjoy doing it. I mean, why else do you do it? You enjoy it. I mean. I enjoy the offices, I enjoy the people, I enjoy the, the clients, I enjoy the, you know, the, the whole doing of designing the offices, getting the clients in, and the more we do it, the more we enjoy it. It's, it's, it's fun, and Bonnie, Bonnie will, I think, tell you the same. So we started that uh, eventually. I was with Canino for a couple years, a um, few years, and then I heard in 1990, if you set up a trust, you don't have to go to court to settle the estate. I said, well, that's, this is a no-brainer. I mean, who wouldn't want to avoid a court proceeding? I've been a litigator for 11 years, you know? When you go to court, who's in charge? The judge, right? Now, tell me, does a judge always act in your best interest? Does, judge, does a judge ever make a mistake? Every case I lost, a judge made a mistake. <laughs> And, the, and when the judge says jump, your answer has to be what? How high, Your Honor. <laughs> so who wouldn't want to avoid a court proceeding? I mean, we get, we get a fee of 3% of an estate to probate a will, 3% to probate, 1% to settle a trust. You know, $500,000 estate, we get $15,000 to take it to court. The exact same estate, if it's in a trust, we get $5,000. Who doesn't want to save $10,000? What's the savings? It's the cost of going to court. So we started living trust uh, practice. We went great guns. Boy, when we started, all you did was you threw an ad in the, in the paper, and 200 people showed up. And you know, there was so much business. As one of my colleagues said, it's like slop over the sides of the bucket, you know? Just uh, we're doing 80, 90 trusts a month. Great, great, great. Nothing lasts forever. <laughs> Competitors spring up, right? Of course, you know you don't have any competitors, right? We, we all know that. Right. You know why you have no competitors? Because there's nobody like you. There's nobody anything like you in the whole world, so you don't have any competitors. But you have competition. And eventually, we had to uh, diversify. That's why we went into the elder law. We did Medicaid seminars. We did living trust seminars. We tried radio. You try all kinds of things. And some things work, and some things don't. And some things work for a time, and you adjust. We tried direct mail. We found direct mail to be the most powerful marketing force of all, because it's targeted. You say who you mail it to. You know, you get lists. You get, 
Are, do we have a direct mail specialist? Yes. <laughs> All right. We'll pay you later. Don't worry. Yeah. Oh, Jill? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> direct mail is, uh, has been our most successful uh, media. You know, advertising is expensive, but you, you know what David Ogilvy said about advertising? You've all heard this, right? The only thing more expensive than advertising is not advertising. Yeah. We've had people, cooperative people, come and join us. Financial planners pay for half of our seminars, and they come in, and they, they're in for a while, and they spend money, and they start to feel the pain, and then they quit. And you know what? They always come back. Every one of them that quits, they always come back. Because they realize, yeah, it was painful, but it's even more painful not to do it. Yeah. It's more painful when no clients are coming in. It's called staying power. Staying power. That's the thing about advertising and marketing. You know, it's, it's constant. It's not hit and miss. It's organized. And it's... Um, Something that you have to keep going all the time and innovating all the time. We've tried television, you know, we've had very success, radio. But again, direct mail. Now, direct mail is very, very sophisticated today because of digital, um, digital revolution. You can actually direct mail custom pieces. You can even change every piece if you want. Um, but one of the things we found is if you're direct mailing, you know, make it custom for the area, the locale, not just the people and the product, but also the locale. So we have an Orange, Orange County postcard. We have a Dutchess County postcard. You know, we have a Staten Island postcard. You know, they've got pictures of Staten Island Ferry, you know, on the, on the, on the, on the Middletown one. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, one or two landmarks. Just to make it local, give it a local flavor. Um, we're very big on internet marketing. When I say CPC, does everybody know what I'm talking about? Does anybody know what a CPC is? Yeah. But you have to know about CPC. Does everybody know about SEO? How many people know what SEO stands for? OK, good. We're coming. That, that's progress. Well, CPC is cost per click. It's paid advertising, cost per click. That's one way to market. In other words, search engine optimization. Okay? If you're in business, you can't be in business if you don't have a website. I remember, um, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when the fax machine came out and talking to one of my, my business colleagues, another lawyer, a friend of mine, he said, I oh, don't need a fax. You know, what do you need a fax for? You know, newfangled thing. You know, there's people who actually think that way about their website. You know, if you don't have a website, as far as I'm concerned, you don't have a business. It's not legitimate. Because people are going to say, OK, well, you know, I'll look at your website. Or you know, I can get the... If you say, what, do you, what does it say if it says, I don't have a website? It says, I'm not, I'm not in business yet. That's what it says to a lot of people. I'm not, you know, I don't mean to insult you. You know, you don't have a website, you're not in business. So I don't mean to be so, you know, so blunt about it. But I'm talking from the point of view of the consumer, the buyer. A lot of buyers are going to say, oh, no website, no business, because that's all they look at. You know, we spend an incredible amount of time on that website because we know third parties are going there to kick the brick, you know, check out the business, legitimacy. <laughs> Do their own. Everybody wants to be their own researcher. You know, WebMD, all this. If you don't have it, you're in trouble from a business point of view. So get one. Darn, just get a home page. You know, start with something. But you have to be in the game. And then you expand. If you get a chance, though, go to trustlaw.com. Watch the animation. It costs $13,500. Please watch it. <laughs> but it was worth it. So the reason that a lot of you are not doing 
the marketing, you're not intent on it, is why? You're afraid. What are you afraid of? You're afraid of making a mistake, right? All the best entrepreneurs, all the most successful business people in the world, in every business, got there by making more mistakes than anybody else. <coughs> Nobody makes more mistakes than I do, you know, proud of it. We make tons of mistakes. I opened an office in New York City a number of years ago at One Pen Plaza, spent $135,000 furnishing it, didn't make one cent, not a penny. People, first of all, it came in, you know, you, you put on seminars in New York City, nobody comes. And then the people who come, I'll, I'll never forget the woman who came in and said, don't touch me and don't touch my purse. <laughs> I remember the couple who came in, nice looking couple, well dressed, sat down, spoke to them for an hour and a half. At the end of the hour and a half, they said, we don't believe you. <laughs> oh, really? Well, thank you. Thanks very much, you know. You know, after a few of these uh, experiences, we closed the office and, and, you know, moved on. It was a mistake. We made others. But strategic coach says that in order to grow, you have to get outside your comfort zone. In other words, what does growth feel like? Well, you step outside into a place you're uncomfortable. That's when you know something's happening. You know, if you're perfectly comfortable, nothing's happening. But if you step outside and you get uncomfortable, it doesn't last very long because what happens is you get to something we call the new normal. The new normal. The new normal is People adapt very quickly. You get used to the new things. So, you know when you get a new car, you know, first few weeks, wow, wow, ooh, it smells good. Oh, I just, I love, you know, and then, you know, a month or two, you're like, you know, don't even think about it, you know? It's your car. Everything's like that. So have courage. Now, I like to say courage is cumulative. It builds on itself. You do one thing, it gives you the courage to do the next thing, gives you the courage to do the next thing, yeah, I, I um, built up a reservoir of courage over many years. When I graduated from McGill, um, I decided to go to London, uh, London School of Economics, to get my Master of Law degrees. Uh, because I graduated, I got in early, which was great, but I got out too early. I was 22, graduated from law school. I said, who, who needs a 22-year-old lawyer? So. I didn't think I could market that, okay? <laughs> so I said, I need something more. So I went and got a master's in, in international maritime law because I was interested in actually, you know, that, that area law, but I thought that was marketable too because I wanted to move to the United States from Canada. I said, who's gonna hire a lawyer from McGill as opposed to Yale, Harvard, or wherever? But I got a master's in, in maritime law and I wrote a book on it. And actually, um, when I got hired by a very good firm in, in the Chrysler building, um, they told me later that uh, when I was hired, uh, one of the partners went up and down the hall saying, we got the guy who wrote the book. <laughs> if you get any opportunity, write a book. Because when you write a book, you're not the same person as you were before. Because before, you were just you. But after you write the book, you're the guy or gal who wrote the book. It's totally different. Not only is it different, but you feel different, you act different, you go around as an author. An author. And virtually all of you have a book in you. And today you do it yourself. Go to createspace.com, <laughs> do your own book. And they put on Amazon for you too. Wonderful. Now, the great thing about the Create Space setup is anytime I want to change a word in my book, Paragraph, add a chapter, go to Create Space, do it, they send you proof, boom, the new book is, because it's all print on demand. Okay, so the new book is, you know, it's an instant, it's there. So courage is human. You know what Churchill said about courage? He said, courage is the most important of all qualities because without courage, none of the others matter. Right? Because if you're not out there, if you're not doing it, it doesn't matter 
How wonderful you are. Uh, Bonnie said I would mention, uh, I'm just keeping an eye on things, uh, I would mention the E-Myth. Um, Michael Gerber wrote a famous book called The E-Myth, The Entrepreneurial Myth. And you know, the, most entrepreneurs are just working their rear ends off and they're just working harder and harder and harder and they're trying to, trying to do everything. And so they spend all their time working in the business, right? And they don't spend any time working on the business. So pick up the E-Myth. If you find you're spending too much time working in your business, you need to shift and spend more time working on your business, right? Making it grow, improve, marketing, et cetera. And this is, you know, this is a basic, you know, every entrepreneur has to read the book. It's a basic text. Um, you know what the strategic coach says? I'm going to just jump around a little bit. Strategic coach says, you know, there's literally thousands of people who desperately need your services. Thousands of people desperately need your services. You actually know that. And if that's the case, don't you think you have a duty to get them the information they need to know about you and your service? And wouldn't it be a disservice for them to go anywhere else? Wouldn't it be a I mean, that's how I feel about our firm. Because what we have built up in terms of the knowledge base and the quality of the work that we do, it would be terrible for somebody to have to go to somebody else if they came to see us. Because they wouldn't get a fraction of what they're going to get from us. Because amongst other things, we keep moving the free line. Here's something we do. No other, no other firms in the United States do this. One of the things we do is we don't take a retainer. Have you ever heard a law firm that doesn't take a retainer? You know you know what a retainer is? Well, pay us something now, we'll get started, and you pay the balance later as we go on. We don't take a retainer. We have meetings, no charge. We sign a, 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 give a client a proposal. They don't sign it. And when they tell, tell us to go ahead, we go ahead, we produce all the documents, we prepare, they say, we do everything. We don't get paid anything until the end after, after everything is signed. What is, what is going on there? Why do we do that? It's a guarantee. There's a guarantee in there. I'm guaranteeing to you, my client, that you'll be satisfied. And if you're not 100% satisfied, you don't owe me anything. It works great. It's just a great system. We only have happy clients because of the system, and that's how we run a firm. We have uh, well over 10,000 clients, and they're all happy because they all came in the right way. The system guarantees, guarantees that. You know about the four SWs? Some will, some won't. So what? Someone's waiting. <laughs> Keep it in mind. <laughs> If you're a marketing person, you see marketing everywhere. I mean, you see things that other people don't see. In this week's Economist, <clears throat> there's an obituary. I read this. I said, this is a great marketing piece, the obituary of Eddie Stobart. I never heard of Eddie Stobart. But let me read this to you, okay? I just want to read something to you, okay? Since first impressions were the most important, Eddie Stobart's lorries, it's British, trucks, right? were not only big, they were not only beautifully livered, liveried in white, red and gold, and Brunswick green, they were immaculate, they gleamed. He cleaned them himself, even on Christmas Eve. If it meant sleeping on a filing shelf in the office to catch them before they went out again, he did it. He cleaned them in the early years when he hauled lime and slag all days on the roads around Carlisle, and he was still cleaning them in 1985 when he had 26 of them. He had a Karcher, heavy-duty washer by then, but there were always bits he liked to finish off by hand when everyone else had gone home. And not only the lorries were smart, open the door and out would climb a driver in black trousers and a green jacket with a flying S motive sewn on the pocket and a silk polyester tie. The Stobart uniform, his own design. It got a bit of mocking in the truck stops, of course, but it made the drivers professional, proud of what they were doing. And it made Stobart's different and famous. By 2000, the firm had 25,000 fans spotting the trucks, listing, listing every sighting, collecting the girls' names painted on every cab, from Twiggy and Tammy to homely Joan Doreen. 
They waved from their cars and from motorway bridges as his lorries thundered by. His drivers were instructed to wave smartly back. Okay. People wondered how he'd done it. Much of the answer was to work all of God's hours all the time. His honeymoon was a night at a truck stop before he had to run a load to Hartlepool. All right. But you get the point. Okay. This tremendous pride. I mean, I do that myself. When I'm in an office uh, and I close the lights, I just look around and I say, boy, this is really nice. You know, I just love this office. It's beautiful. You know, all the offices, they're just beautiful. I just like to just look around and say, wow, this is just so nice here. You know, why are the office, you know, a couple of years ago, I think it's three years ago now, when the recession was absolute at the, you know, it was the pits, no business, dead. I went to the bank, borrowed $300,000, redid all my offices to reposition everything for the next decade. Because my theory or philosophy is my office is all about how I feel when I'm there. So if I feel good, then that's going to project to the, I design it so that I feel good. It's designed for me, my taste, my, but you know, but I have good taste, unfortunately, so it's, you know, <laughs> you know if, you, if you don't have good taste, hire it, you know, but, but they're really, really, you know, nice, beautiful offices, and we feel good, and we feel good, and the clients feel good, you know, et cetera. So I gave you something, uh, from Brian Tracy, I just I want to highlight just a few things, and then um, maybe we'll just take a few minutes for questions. The Psychology of Selling by Brian Tracy, one of the best marketing books I ever read, and um, I, I liked it so much I did an executive summary. And there's a few things I want to mention. First of all, the most important marketing principle bar none that you can do to improve your business is to improve yourself. You are your business. It's a mirror. It's a complete reflection of you. Okay? If you improve yourself, you improve your business. It's, it's as clear as it could be. You know? And it's your, you know, your self-concept. You must keep yourself at a high self-esteem level. I, you know, I, I practice self-motivation. I work on it, you know, sometimes more than others. Sometimes I don't need to, you know. Um, you know, it could be weeks or months, you know, I'm just up all the time, not a problem. But if I'm down, uh, you know, which happens to all of us, right, I, I, then I go to work on it. I get myself back up again. Now, Zig Ziglar was a master motivator. And they asked Zig, they said, Zig, you know, this motivation stuff doesn't last. He said, how can you, you, you know it doesn't last. Why do you keep doing it? He says, so he says well, look, bathing does doesn't last either. That's why I do it every day. <laughs> you know, not, nothing, you know, but it works. So in, in my inbox, actually, you know, I don't even realize, but in my inbox, I get two uh, um, uh, inspirational type of things coming to my email every day, and I read them every day. I didn't even realize it. One is uh, abraham.hicks.com. Good stuff. Um, they have, uh, you can get there saying, you know, th uh, thing of the day. Um, positive re re reinforcement. How about the friendship factor? Tell me if this sounds familiar to you. The customers today are spoiled. They are demanding. They are disloyal. They insist on being treated extremely well before they buy anything. And more than anything else, customers will only buy from people they like. We call this the friendship factor. The friendship factor simply says to a prospect they won't buy from you until they're genuinely, genuinely convinced that you're their friend and acting in their best interest. It took me a long time to figure this out, to be, to be candid with you, you know. Now, when I sit down with a client, I sit down, uh, my modus operandi, we sit down and talk for an hour, and I tell the clients ahead of time, we, we, we don't do any business in the first meeting, because we're just trying to get to know each other, see what's important, you know. And you create a relaxed atmosphere so that people uh, spill the beans, you know. Keep people talking long enough, relaxed enough, they're going to tell you everything that you need to know. So create the environment. I was not the best at it. I might at one time been the worst. But I'm, I'm very good at it now because uh, I trained in it. Um, you know, if, the, if there's a hook, you know, if you want to take a cane and pull me aside or something, I don't want to go over my time. Is anybody watching my time? And Am I okay for another few minutes? 
<laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, okay, so I do that. A, a couple things. Um, well, there's things here on why people buy. You know, I mean, you, you, you want to read this, but I'm just going to flip through it very quickly and see if there's, I know there's one or two things that are extremely important to me. And I guess the biggest one is, Listening. I just want to talk a moment about listening. We're not trained to listen. We don't have this innate ability to listen. We have to train ourselves. So let me just say what I want to say about listening. Okay. Brian Tracy is brilliant, and absolutely brilliant. I mean, his books, he's been a great uh, sales and marketer for years. But he says, when you're listening to somebody, listen, physically listen, okay? He says, imagine that your eyes are sun lamps and you're trying to give your prospect a 10. And I found that by focusing on the client and being fully present, you know, being fully present, this is what uh, psychoanalysts do, psychiatrists, th psychotherapists, they're fully present. You know, I have friends in this, and they've, they've taught me this. When they sit down with a client, okay, they are completely there. They have nothing else in their mind. They're just listening, and they're not thinking about anything else, not doing anything else. It takes a lot of effort to listen. It's hard work. It's work, you know, to listen attentively. But here's the amazing thing, okay? Did you know that when a prospect is intensely listened to, he experiences specific physiological changes? There's physiological changes in the person who's being listened to. Okay? Their heart rate goes up, their blood pressure goes up, their gal galvanic skin, galvanic, whatever that word is, <laughs> galvanic skin response increases. And when a person is intensely listened to, her self-esteem goes up. She feels more valued. She likes themselves more. And as a result, they like the person who's listening to them more. Okay. So, I think that's, uh, you know, I could go on for another hour. So I'm going <laughs> to leave it at that.